I needed an on-camera microphone and recently I built one. In this video, we'll create a high-quality dynamic microphone for cameras featuring an adjustable op-amp that works with both phantom power and external batteries. Then, we will compare its sound quality with other popular dynamic microphones. If you have tried different microphones, you have probably noticed that your voice sounds different on each one. If I use this cheap USB microphone, you can tell that something feels off even if you can't pinpoint exactly what it is. So what determines whether a microphone is good or bad? There are a few key factors. First and foremost is the element that converts sound waves into electrical signals. For example, if I remove the metal grid from this microphone, you will see a capsule, which is one of the most important components that can significantly impact how you sound. It all comes down to physics. A small microphone capsule simply cannot capture the full range of sound frequencies that the human voice can produce. So should we just find the largest capsule available, choose the one with the biggest diameter and build a microphone out of it? Well, the answer is, it depends. This assumption isn't entirely wrong. A larger capsule can indeed produce better sound because it captures more sound waves, allowing for a more accurate conversation into electrical signals. But a larger capsule can also introduce other problems, mainly the background noise. So it may not be ideal for all use cases. That's why most podcasters prefer dynamic microphones, like Shure MV7. Even Joe Rogan uses one. Only difference on this one is, this one has a built-in preamp. If you look at his setup, you'll notice that while there are some curtains to help with sound control, it's not a fully treated studio with an excessive amount of acoustic panels. Dynamic microphones are simply more forgiving when it comes to unwanted background noises. Ultimately, it all comes down to your specific use case and finding a microphone that produces a sound that you like. That's why I stopped using my old Blue Yeti microphone. Although it's a decent microphone, it picked up too much background noise, making it difficult to use. Since I don't have sound treatment in my room and I don't want to install any, it just wasn't the right fit for me. In my case, I wanted a decent dynamic microphone that I could use with my camera. I really like the SM57. It is typically known as an instrument microphone, but I also like how it sounds on vocals. However, I prefer a modified version rather than the original SM57. Inside the SM57, there is a transformer and there is a popular mode where people remove it. This modification makes the microphone sound more flatter and more neutral. And I found out that you can order replacement SM57 capsules separately. And that's exactly what I did. This isn't an original capsule by the way, but it has received a lot of positive feedbacks. Since it only costs like $4, I wanted to give it a go. You generally don't need phantom power to use dynamic microphone capsules. However, the sound signal from this capsule is very weak, so we need to build a preamp circuitry to make it usable. To amplify the sound signals coming from the capsule, I designed a preamp circuitry in KiCad. I plan to place the PCB inside the microphone, so I won't need to carry an external preamp. Once my design was complete, I ordered the PCBs from GLC PCB. If you want to make the same circuit, you can simply upload the Gerber files to their website. You can find these files in the production folder under the GitHub link provided in the description. Ordering 5 boards cost me around $2. I only changed the color to purple for aesthetic reasons, you can choose any color you like. The PCBs have arrived. I wasn't expecting them to be completed in just 3 days. If I had been in a hurry, ordering a default green color would have been a faster option. This is the main IC. That's 1510. There is also a DIP package version of the same IC, but in most cases soldering SMD packages is actually easier and faster. In fact, I could have designed the entire board using deep packaged components. And even instead of using a custom PCB, you could also use a perf board like this one to build the same circuitry. However, the problem with that approach is that it's much harder to achieve clean sound quality compared to a custom PCB. So I think spending just $2 is definitely worth it. I also ordered a stencil from them but wasn't careful with my selection and ended up with one that was way too large. If you also want to order a stencil, be mindful of stencil size options available and select one that suits your needs. 
So I need to cut it down to size to make it easier to use for me. You don't have to order a stencil if you are only making one or two boards. But if you plan to make several, a stencil can save you a lot of time. This size is much easier for me to work with compared to the previous much larger one. And the next time I'll be more careful with my order. For soldering, I'll use this low temperature solder paste. I prefer this one but you can use any brand you like. Just make sure to stay away from high temperature solder pastes. If you didn't order a stencil, it's also easy to work with with this syringe type solder paste. You can simply apply some directly to the footprint pads. So you don't have to have a stencil like this. To use the stencil, I placed PCBs like this way. After securing the PCBs with some tape, I applied solder paste on top of the stencil. Then I found a metal piece lying around and used that to spread the solder paste. You can also use a credit card or something similar. This way, you can apply a correct amount of solder paste each time without wasting any time. KiaCat also has a handy bill of materials tool that helps you select the components. After that, it's simply a matter of picking and placing the parts in the their correct location on the PCB one by one. Come on, you can also do this, it's very easy. The next step is using the hot air gun. I set my hot air gun to 350 Celsius degrees. I am not sure why, but I find it quite satisfying to watch the solder paste melt. There is just something about it. And this is how it looks after soldering all the parts. I designed this as a regular audio preamp, so instead of using it for this specific purpose, you can also use it as a standard preamp. I left the footprint for another XLR input for this reason. And from this knob you can adjust the amplification levels. There are a few things worth mentioning about this PCB. On the top right, I left space to get the phantom power for other daughter or parent ports, so you can use that to power them up. In the middle section, we have the main audio op-amp. I chose this one because it had good reviews and it was also available for ordering. Here I have a connected solder bridge in case you want to use only external power to power the board. This could be useful if you don't have access to phantom power for the device you plan to use with this microphone. If that's the case, after cutting the solder bridge with a knife or something similar, you can solder your battery or another external DC power source. You need more than 5 volts to power up this port though. On the top left of the PCB, it says phantom power. As I mentioned earlier, dynamic microphone capsules don't need phantom power to function. However, you may want to use the same circuit for condenser capsules as well. For those, you'll need to cut the existing solder bridge connections and bridge the other ends of the solder bridge footprints with some solder. Lastly, I placed another solder bridge here, marked as hex inverter. If you need to invert your signals, you can use it the same way I described for the phantom power. And if you want to use it as a regular external preamp, you can solder a female XLR connection to this end and it will function as one. Also be sure to check the latest version on the GitHub page as there might be some updates or tweaks to the current version. If you want to use the batteries to power this up, I recommend using this type of 9V battery. They provide clean current so they won't interfere with the audio signals as much. Another option would be using lithium ion batteries, but they only provide up to 3.7V. You can use this type of lithium ion charger along with a step up board like this one. However, you may want to shield the voltage regulator and also step up converter as some of them can introduce too much noise into the circuitry. Now we need a casing for the microphone. As the next step, I designed one and 3D printed it using my 3D printer. The 3D printing is complete and the microphone capsule will fit into this piece like this. And the PCB will go into this tube-like piece. The preamp level adjustment knob will come out through this hole. And lastly, this circular plate will cover the hole on the tube. It looks pretty straightforward, but there is one big issue here. If we just continue assembling all the parts and call it a day, there is a risk of electromagnetic interference affecting the microphone. Since we used an amplifier, those interferences could be converted into audio noise, which can be quite annoying. With so many electronic devices around, signal pollution is a real issue. Even your phone or Wi-Fi router can interfere with the microphone's sound quality. That's why it's highly recommended to take precautions against such interference when building a microphone. This problem is solved through shielding. 
If you look at any decent microphone, you'll notice that they usually have a metal casing. It's not just to give a premium feel to the consumer, it actually serves as a shield, helping to capture clean audio from the capsule by blocking electromagnetic interference. Because of this shielding, even if I bring my phone close to the microphone, it won't create any noise in the audio. So before assembling the parts, I want to address this issue first, because having a clean audio is one of the main requirements of a decent microphone. There are a few ways to achieve shielding, and I want to find the cheapest and easiest option. I thought about using a metal tape with a copper tape being the first option that comes to mind. Copper tape should work very well for this purpose, but it's somewhat harder to find and can be pricey. So instead I decided to use aluminum tape. It's cheaper and readily available at any hardware store. Its performance should be sufficient for this application. The application is fairly simple. First, you take a rough measurement by wrapping the tape around the part. Then cut it with scissors. Afterwards, slowly stick it around the outside of the 3D printed parts. This small step is important. After applying the tape, you need to bend it like this way. The reason is that you'll be applying tape to the tube part as well and the metal pieces should touch each other properly to create a better shield. Otherwise, you risk amplifying the noise along with the sound signals. I'll do the same for the other parts as well. Just give me a few seconds. Now I've wrapped aluminum tape around all the parts, including the bottom plate and of course the capsule holder. I did the same trick on the both ends of the tube part. After installing them together, all metal pieces, I mean the tape, needs to touch each other. I soldered the potentiometer to PCB using two cables. The reason for this is that the microphone body was already too thick and I didn't want to make it any thicker by soldering it directly to the PCB. And onto these two cables, I will connect the microphone capsule. Let's start assembling all the parts. The microphone capsule will be put in here. The most important thing here is leaving this gap untouched because it has a function to balance the audio, make sure not to cover it with tape or anything. If you order the capsule from the same place I did, you will receive these three pieces as well. Now let's install them. I first installed this rubber-like plastic and then this PCB-like piece. It's probably like flexi glass or something. Then I installed the nut which came with it. And I will connect the bottom plate to the XLR connections with two screws. The bottom plate should look like this after installation. Visually ensure that it's properly positioned. The two remaining cable will be soldered to the capsule later on. On the PCB, the green cable is soldered to the middle pin of the XLR port, while the white cable is soldered to the bottom pin. The green cable needs to be soldered to the hot end of the capsule, which is marked in red on the connection. The white cable will be soldered to the cold or unmarked end of the microphone capsule. After soldering the connections, I applied a bit of lubricant to the dress to make it easier to screw them together. Since it's 3D printed, using some lubricant helps a lot. Then you need to tighten it up. It will be a tight fit, so you need to apply a bit of force. To check the shielding, I set my multimeter to continuity mode and verify that all parts are properly connected. If yours doesn't work, now it's time to fix it. Our microphone is ready to use. However, I didn't like the look of the aluminum tape, so I'll paint mine to black. With the black paint, it looked like this. To make it look a bit nicer, I will use these knob caps on the potentiometer. It will make adjusting the amplification level easier. Of course, you can call a microphone a microphone without a sponge. I'll install one as it helps with wind noise and also serves as a puff filter. With the sponge installed, I really like the look of it this way. I also designed and 3D printed a microphone holder for the cameras. It fits into the standard hot shoes on cameras and you can install it to position the microphone to the right or to the left, like this, by sliding it through. Since I plan to use this while holding my camera handheld, we need to find a solution to reduce the vibration noises. For this, I am going to use these 5cm diameter O-rings, which are originally designed for sealing components. However, they also work great for absorbing vibrations. You can directly install them onto the microphone holder through the grooves. You don't necessarily need to use 5cm ones if you have similar sized o-rings available. They should work just fine well because they are highly elastic. After installing 4 of them, it looks like this. 
The microphone will pass through the middle and the O-rings will hold the microphone in place, helping to eliminate any vibration noises that might occur while recording a handheld video. If you want to use it with your PC, you can connect it to a USB audio interface using a standard XLR cable. Just make sure to activate the phantom power to power the preamp. Some cameras have mini XLR ports for audio and in that case, you can use this type of adapter. I choose the XLR connection for my design because it's very flexible and finding a good quality cable is way easier. I also recommend using a screw to secure it in place if you have a cage for your camera. It will make the setup more rigid. Of course each camera is different so you'll need to check the user manual for your specific camera. However I will show you how to use it with the Blackmagic 6K camera since that's the one I have. Simply go to audio settings on your camera, select the XLR port as input and don't forget to enable phantom power. After that, set the gain using the knob on the microphone and make any minor adjustments on the camera. Just speak to the microphone as you normally would and make sure the signal isn't clipping. The soundbar shouldn't reach the right area, aim for the yellow zone or slightly lower than that. The project is finally complete and now comes the most interesting part. How a do-it-yourself microphone will compete with high-amp microphones or if it can compete at all. This will be very interesting. A small spoiler alert, I have been using my new microphone for the entire video, so you should already be familiar with how it sounds. And I must say, even though the replacement capsule isn't the original, I am very satisfied with it. In this comparison, I won't use any corrections or equalizer settings. It will be the raw performance. I will only slightly adjust the volume to match the levels of different microphones. So let's compare it with the original SM57 microphone. Since this microphone has enough amplification, I have to talk a bit louder to achieve a similar output. But it is a sound that I like. Of course, your opinion might be different. And this is the sound from my microphone. Since it has more than enough amplification, I can speak normally without needing to shout or raise my voice. This is the sound from my old microphone, the Blue Yeti. It's a popular USB microphone that I have connected to my PC. And you are hearing the recording directly from it. I stopped using this microphone because of the background noise it picks up. Additionally, it wasn't practical to use with my camera due to its weight. If you are wondering, I am using the cardioid pattern on the Blue Yeti, which is the recommended setting for normal use. Also, my microphone has a single sound pattern, which is also cardioid. This is the new microphone from Shurei MV7 Plus. It has a USB output which might be useful for some streamers. Right now you are hearing the sound from its USB output. To use my microphone on a PC, you need a sound interface. And right now you are hearing again from Shurei MV7 Plus. But this time the sound is coming from the XLR output. I'm not sure if you can notice any difference. Even though the MV7 Plus is convenient to use, it didn't meet my requirements, which ended up causing me extra work during video editing. Now comes the test I am really curious about, the comparison with the most famous podcast microphone. This is SM7 TV, which is exactly the same as SM7B, with the only difference being that it has a built-in preamp or cloud lifter. Right now you are hearing it with the cloud lifter turned on. You also don't need a cloud lifter to use my microphone because it already has a built-in preamp. You can adjust the amplification using the knob on the microphone. Now I am speaking into the SM7DB with the preamp turned off. To get a clear sound I have to speak louder and it is not very comfortable to use it this way. Now I am curious to hear your thoughts on the sound of my microphone. How does it compare to others? I would love to hear your thoughts on this project as well as your opinions on the sound in the comments below. While I may not have the voice of a singer, this comparison should give you an idea of the sound quality. You can definitely use the same circuitry with other microphone capsules, whether dynamic or condenser, but keep in mind that you'll need to design your own casing. However, the precautions I described in this video apply to all setups, so take care and I'll see you next time.